So there is a variety of reactions and what reactions can look like with food allergies. And I think that is what makes it hard for people to understand food allergies. So some people will think you have to have hives. Hives do not have to be a part of a reaction. You can have GI, you can have vomiting, you can have diarrhea, you can have discomfort, you can have respiratory impacts, breathing, you can have swelling inside and outside. So the tef technical definition of an anaphylactic reaction, which is a severe food allergic reaction, or it could be um, induced by drugs or bee stings, insects, things like that, but it's a severe reaction, is it involves two systems. So if we think about the body, it could involve the GI, maybe there's vomiting, and then it can involve breathing. Mm. Or it can involve skin, which is a system with hives, and then discomfort in, in, the, in the stomach, which is GI. Welcome to the Exercise is Health podcast, where we're talking about exercise, health, and the interconnectedness of the two. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we will be coming to you every single week from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Exercise is Health podcast. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we are coming to you from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg in Schaumburg, Illinois. Now, at Muscle Activation Schaumburg, we believe your health is your most valuable asset. Your health is one of the biggest influencers of the quality and quantity of time that you have. And while there are many aspects of health, our expertise is exercise. Exercise has been proven time and again to not only improve your health, but also increase your longevity and improve your quality of life. But we know that exercise is not the only piece of the puzzle. And that is why we are bringing you a rock star guest today, none other than Tamara Hubbard. Tamara Hubbard is a licensed clinical professional counselor in private practice in Long Grove, Illinois. Her areas of focus are women, life transitions, and supporting clients managing food allergies or allergic conditions, especially parents and caregivers. Tamara is a member of the American Counseling Association and an allied health professional member of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, as well as the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. In addition to her clinical work, she created the Food Allergy Counselor Directory and website to help families locate food allergy-informed clinical counseling providers and food allergy mental health resources. You can learn more about Tamara's counseling services at TamaraHubbardLCPC.com or visit FoodAllergyCounselor.com for food allergy mental health information. Tamara, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. You bet. So tell us more about your background, how you got into becoming a licensed clinical professional counselor, as well as how your interest in, well, specifically food allergies started. So I didn't start off off in food allergies. I actually started off uh, with a master's in marriage and family therapy. I then transitioned into helping those with substance abuse disorders, primarily teens. Not an area I had at all, had at all wanted to work in, but that's how life went. Got me into that space for a while. What made me transition into primarily food allergy counseling or focusing on helping those managing food allergies is that one of my, my children has a food allergy. So most of us enter this space by need rather than by desire. Mm -hmm. So when he was uh, diagnosed at three years old with a peanut allergy, and then I had my own journey, which I'm still on, by the way, I saw the need for help and helping others that were managing this journey and were having some psychosocial impacts along the way because that is a piece of this journey. Okay, and, and just to kind of set the, the framework for everything, can we just start by like, what's the definition of a food allergy? Yeah, absolutely, because I think that that is, there's a lot of misconceptions about what food allergies are. There are terms like food intolerances or food sensitivities that people use to put in place of food allergies and they're not the same thing. So by definition, a food allergy is a chronic illness where the immune system exhibits adverse effects if it's introduced, it has the allergen introduced to it. So it's an immune system response, whereas, you know, food allergies, or I'm sorry, food intolerances and food sensitivities are not something that's going to go through the immune system. You might have GI discomfort, you might have, you know, feeling physically unwell, but it's not something that's going to go through the immune system and it's not going to be life-threatening. So food allergies have the potential to be life-threatening. So then could the kind of range of complications um, be from like, the acute of, say, you know, breaking out in hives to something more chronic, say, like an autoimmune condition? So, yeah. So there is a variety of reactions and what reactions can look like with food allergies. And I think that is what makes it hard for people to understand food allergies. So some people will think
think you have to have hives. Hives do not have to be a part of a reaction. You can have GI, you can have vomiting, you can have diarrhea, you can have discomfort, you can have respiratory impacts, breathing, you can have swelling inside and outside. Again, hives are part of it. So the technical definition of an anaphylactic reaction, which is a severe food allergic reaction, or it could be um, induced by drugs or bee stings, insects, things like that, but it's a severe reaction, is it involves two systems. So if we think about the body, it could involve the GI, maybe there's vomiting, and then it can involve breathing. Mm. Or it can involve skin, which is a system with hives, and then discomfort in, in the in the stomach, which is GI. And then, you know, when you have either a persistent one system reaction or you have two systems involved, the step is to use epinephrine. Epinephrine is the only way to to halt or stop a reaction. Huh. Um, and a lot of people will use antihistamines or have that on their their action plan, emergency action plan. But the only thing that that helps with is some some mild hives. Oh. So epinephrine is the only way to stop a reaction. And usually at that point, you want to be monitored at the hospital or by medical uh, professionals because not because of the use of epinephrine, but because there could be an additional reaction that comes up and another dose of epinephrine that will be needed to be given. Nice. So I know a lot of these food allergies, especially these anaphylactic react you call it reaction or shock so that's different too and i think that okay. that's a, uh, what people don't know anaphylactic shock is more of the severe severe anaphylactic reaction where you're potentially your blood pressure's dropping and you're going into essentially shock with your body mm-hmm. anaphylactic reaction can cover I hate to use the word more mild parts of the anaphylactic reaction. So mm-hmm. yeah, but so I usually just call it either anaphylactic reaction or reaction. Great. So these reactions that people have to food is very much in the like medical scope. And I think a lot yeah. of times, like even before I heard about you, you know, you're thinking, oh, peanut allergy, maybe their throat swells up. That seems very medical. Yeah. So or, you know, hives or diarrhea, that's that's like a medical professional. So what is your role with all of this? Because your role yeah. wouldn't be like diagnosis or it wouldn't be like managing it, but what are you doing to help in this space? Certainly not. I am very clear with people I speak with, people I work with, that I am not a doctor. Um, I am not trained in medical, you know, scope. The medical scope is not my scope. Um, however, I would be considered an allied healthcare professional in this space, and that can include dietitians or respiratory therapists, counselors, psychologists, social workers, such as myself. So our role really is to help the individual or families manage the psychosocial impacts that can come along with managing a food allergy. So, you know, we don't live in a silo and we have a medical condition. And again, this this actually relates to any chronic condition, but I just happen to focus on this space. Um, so if you think about diabetes or cancer, this would be sort of a, the same kind of model that they would use. And allied healthcare professionals, counselors specifically, can help Uh, parents, children, adults who are being newly diagnosed with an adult onset food allergy learn to live a balanced life with their food allergy. So the goal is to really help people figure out how to combine vigilance and preparedness, but to not let it impact their life so that they're not making and meeting uh, developmental milestones or letting themselves live life. There will be some avoidance, obviously, of certain situations or foods or people or things like that that might need to take place if you assess the risk and it's a high-risk situation. But sometimes we overestimate that risk and then we start to pull back from a lot of things or develop these overly anxious behaviors avoidant behaviors and so that's how counselors can help the families find this little balance so that they feel like they can approach life even with a food allergy so what what are some things that people come into your office that they're experiencing that you help them with because i mean you know at at the risk of sounding like super ignorant i i feel like hey if, if you found out that you were allergic to gluten or whatever, mm-hmm. you, you just stop eating gluten mm-hmm. and life kind of goes on. But I mean, I, I guess not everybody's like that. So yeah. can, can you kind of enlighten me for that? Sure, absolutely. So you brought up a, a good point because I think the general perception is, okay, you have a food allergy, you avoid eating that, uh, case closed, all done, yeah. safe, no problem. That is the theory and that is the hope. But honestly, there's so many other layers when you're managing a food allergy that people are not necessarily aware of. So there's things like... Um, 
um, food labeling. It is mandated and required by the FDA in the U.S. at least that you label for the top eight. They're working on the top nine. Sesame hopefully added soon as an, a top as a type the top ninth allergen. Mm. If it's an ingredient in a food, it has to be labeled. Oh, However, like where it says like contains wheat, right? Or contains, contains wheat, egg, or right? Whatever. Right. If it's an actual ingredient, it's it needs to be either like bolded or it needs to say contains. And and each manufacturer gets to I guess decide a little bit on how that's going to be presented. Um, but it has to be there now. And, and that's in addition to being on the ingredients label, right? So it's it's on there kind of twice. Not always. Oh, okay. So you really have to read through everything carefully. Sometimes they'll bold it in the ingredient list. Sometimes they'll list it or bold it in the ingredient list and then also put underneath contains. Gotcha. So you can't just look at one and not the other. Okay. But the more, the tougher piece is, and um, I'll preface this by saying that some families or some people managing a food allergy their comfort zone or they were told by their allergist to avoid may contains or made in a facility with mm-hmm. their allergen, mm-hmm. that piece is not mandated by the FDA and how and if it's going to be labeled. So every manufacturer has their own processes on how they're and if they're going to do that, which makes label reading and trusting labels and food manufacturers hard. So it doesn't have to say made in a facility or may contains your allergen. It could say none of that. Some people will then call the the manufacturer and find out what are your processes if you're going to run a food on a line with our allergen. And some people are managing multiple allergens too. So that can pr- potentially present anxiety there. And, a, right. you know, who? how do I trust? Who do I trust? So it kind of makes you feel like you're out of control, that that control is put into the hands of the manufacturer yeah. and you have to make a decision here where your comfort lies. So when you talk about, is it just don't eat your allergen? No, it's really not that simple. You have that. Then if you add in for kids, schools, what's the school policy about food allergies? Is your allergen present? How do you keep the kids safe at school? Are they trained in anaphylaxis and, and you know EpiPen, ep- epinephrine use? Most school districts are, but that varies depending on the school district. Mm-hmm. Then you have to think about you know extracurricular. Act- I mean, so there's a lot of layers here mm-hmm. that have the potential to exacerbate anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I'm really, you know, I, I like to say to to everyone who I talk to about this that look, anxiety is a, a normal human emotion. And we're going to have anxiety in life. And anxiety actually is adaptive in nature in that it can help us be you know, aware and vigilant and making good choices. But when it crosses that line where it becomes unhealthy and it keeps you scared to try things or to experience life or let your children grow up, Mm -hmm. um, that's when it becomes a problem. So it's not necessarily the emotion that's the problem, the anxious feelings. It's what we do with it and how we handle it that becomes a problem. I could see how also if you had a child that was diagnosed with it, that would be hard for the parent. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about... I have a, a an eight month old and you know thinking about her daycare like I try to find out what she's doing throughout the day but you know did I know if the daycare provider used the same jelly knife as right. the peanut butter knife or the almond or whatever it is right I could see how that would be difficult because you're you want to know you know what your kid's doing all day when they're at daycare or school or wherever they are yeah I don't know if you'd be comfortable with this but would you mind sharing what you experienced when your son was diagnosed sure because I think it's interesting and it would be interesting to know like what things went on in your brain and how it made you make this big career shift or yeah. you know focus shift I guess we could say yeah so I'm very upfront and open with people um, most people I, I on my website I have a, the food allergy counselor website I have a blog and actually the first blog entry is my sort of personal story and so you know I tell people yes I may be a professional in this space but I'm also a parent of and on my own journey so when he was diagnosed what what happened was is um, going into preschool, we were never big PB and J eaters. Um, so I thought, okay, well, let me give him a PB and J. He's going to preschool. You know, I've Standard heard of food. allergies, <laughs> right? Yeah, I was like, I've heard of allergies. I'm sure he's fine. And didn't give any thought of it. So I gave it to him, and he, like, within a few minutes of a couple bites, was vomiting. Like, not just like a little bit, a lot. He was sneezing. He had excess mucus. So he was having an anaphylactic reaction. Of course, we were not prepared. I did not have epinephrine auto injector in my house. My first thought was the movie Hitch and the allergic reaction, which Mm -hmm. looked very different. So I pulled out my Benadryl and I gave him that. And we were very lucky. He was fine. You know, 
there's some research that, that points to the, the fact that kids can resolve anaphylaxis, you know, easier, maybe without any help. But again, I preface that with always use your auto injector, always use that if you have any doubt, it's safe to use when in doubt, use it. So anyhow, then we got testing and it showed yes, he did have a peanut allergy. We thought that he might have tree nut allergies as well, but those tests were a little bit inconclusive, so I got advice to follow up on that. We teased them out, and per the allergist suggestion, we did oral food challenges to the six most common tree, nut al- tree nuts, and he does not have tree nut allergies, so he eats those regularly. So, you know, I'll be honest, I was terrified. I, no one in our family had allergies. I didn't quite understand initially the impact it would have. My older son, uh, I could see, was a little bit nervous too. And I felt very ill-equipped to manage a child with a food allergy. And so I can remember the night before he went to kindergarten, I literally fell to the ground Aww. and started crying. Aww. Because just what you said, I had to let somebody else care for my child. Yeah. And did I trust them? And yes, we had talked and we had created what's called a 504 plan and talked about their food allergy policies, which, by the way, was were very new in our district. I mean, they were there, but they weren't as uh, developed as they are now years later. But through just putting one foot in front of the other, educating myself, I sort of reached this point a few years later where I decided that one way that I was going to handle this feeling was becoming empowered and educating myself more and then in turn becoming an advocate. So my first step was becoming a food allergy advocate. And then over time, and again, still doing counseling in a different area, but um, over time I started to then discuss take that to the next level and say, well, who's talking about the mental health impacts of food allergies for parents, for those managing it, for adults that are newly diagnosed with an allergy and have to change their lifestyle? And yeah, people had touched on it, but it wasn't a like topic that was really out there. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, there seemed to be this huge need in the community. Mm-hmm. And so when I started to talk about it, it like exploded. Mm-hmm. And the last year and a half, two years have gone faster than I could even imagine mm-hmm. and developed even quicker than I imagined because of that, because there's a need. Yeah. The allergists are, just, are starting to really be aware of the psychosocial impacts that they're, you know, that are impacting their, their patients. And so they're exploring that more too. And I always encourage people to bring these topics up to their allergists if they're not asking them. Tell them, I'm anxious about this. Make a list of questions. Set up a consultation appointment. Because again, usually in these annual appointments, you get about 15 minutes to do the testing, to talk about that. And here's your EpiPen renewal or, um, you know, uh, s- prescription and we'll see you next year. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, it's it's a shift in thinking. It's this mind-body piece. Sure. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes in medicine, the mind part gets left behind. Mm. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I have sort of evolved into a parent. And again, I tell people, I'm still on this journey. Mm-hmm. I, my son is 10. We have a lot of transitions that are coming up and times of transition, usually where anxieties or stress might peak are when you get the diagnosis, Mm -hmm. when there's transitions in life, such as changing schools, Mm -hmm. if you've had a reaction or your child's had a reaction, and then also if you're uh, looking at doing some kind of a treatment. And okay. considering that or doing that. So I still have transitions coming up with my son in his sure. life, and I'm experiencing it just like anybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm human too. Yeah. So even though I'm in the field and, you know, my job is to help others, I totally get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you find that in your practice you are working mostly with adults then versus kids, whether the adults are the parents of those who are diagnosed or they themselves have recently come diagnosed? Yeah, so I typically, quite honestly, um, I don't work with kids. Mm -hmm. However, I will say, so my practice is usually like 18 and older, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to food allergies, I will be honest and say I'm not trained in play therapy, but... I will work with you guys. What's play therapy? So play therapy is a a certain modality of counseling or therapy where um, you really train in using toys and dolls and and drawing to be the main method of, of, of the work. Okay. You know, obviously, I know how to play and use dolls, but I... So that's geared more towards kids. That is. Yeah. And, and, And I 
kudos to those therapists that specialize in that you know I mean there's a space for all we all have our areas with that being said that doesn't mean I can't work with kids I'm just upfront and honest with them and say I'm not trained in this area but I certainly understand anxiety and can understand how it impacts kids and I understand food allergies so let's give it a try if you feel comfortable we'll work and see if it if it works if not I'm okay for kids to refer out to a child therapist, Mm -hmm. and then if needed, I can consult with that therapist. Gotcha. But, so I do tend to work a lot with parents. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's my sweet spot. I love working with women and moms, um, dads too, men too, but I I really like working with the parents and helping them understand their own food allergy-related anxiety and stress, because quite honestly, when we're dealing with kids, Mm They're setting the tone, Mm -hmm. and if they can't manage their own and understand their own and work through their own stress and anxiety, that makes it very hard to be that role model for your child. And again, if if adults are diagnosed, Mm -hmm. and that's becoming more prominent, so about 11% of adults uh, in a recent study have food uh, food allergies that came on as an adult. Mm. Oh, wow. And... 19% of adults believed they were allergic, but maybe it wasn't a true allergy, but they, they thought they were. So, um, and a lot of those have had a reaction and gone to the hospital. And, you know, and those lines, I was also wondering, like, are you seeing, because the, I want to say the, the prevalence of, of food allergies, at least a discussion about it seems to be becoming more prominent. Do you find that people are almost like misdiagnosing themselves as having food allergies and then are you are you seeing any trend with that where you know if people are believing that they're gluten intolerant or yeah. they you know they um, they shouldn't be having dairy or anything like that do you, do you find that there's a greater appearance of food allergies because people are almost tricking themselves into thinking that they have food allergies versus like biologically actually being allergic yeah so that goes back to that discussion of do people understand the difference between an, an IgE-mediated allergy versus like a sensitivity or intolerance? Because the reality is, even on blood tests, again, this is out of my scope, but I'm just sharing sort of what sure. I know from, from the medical perspective, even some of the testing isn't foolproof. So what might show up on your blood tests or your skin tests in the allergist's office might show that you have some you know sensitivity to it but if you can eat that that food and not have some kind of a reaction Mm -hmm. then you might just have a sensitivity or your body's heightened to it Mm -hmm. so yeah I think that it goes back to what do people understand about true allergies food allergies versus intolerances and again it goes back to this immune system response if you're not having an immune system response each and every time you eat that Mm -hmm. then it is likely not a true food allergy Mm -hmm. it could be an intolerance or your body just doesn't tolerate it well or there's something else going on at interplay you know something else medically interplay with the food that you're eating i don't know but again it goes back to the definition of what a true food allergy is and i don't know that everybody's clear on that so people might be self-diagnosing themselves because their stomach hurts when they eat it Mm -hmm. and maybe it is an allergy maybe it's not but they need to go to an allergist and get that figured out Mm -hmm. now when people are coming to see you they're clearly not looking to get a food allergy resolved no or they're not trying to get something newly diagnosed and you've brought up a couple times that you're trying to help with the anxiety with the new like psychosocial changes that happen what kind of interventions can someone like you do and what are the outcome goals that people are looking for, you're looking for that mm-hmm. are saying, yeah, we are managing this really well yeah. with the, the psychological piece of it? So some of the work that I would do would include assessing what their knowledge of food allergy is, especially when it, it's parents and kids <clears throat> who were diagnosed maybe when they were younger, the kids were diagnosed as kids or as babies. Sometimes there there's a gap in their psychoeducation for food allergies. So maybe, you know, they worked real hard at training and teaching their preschooler how to be aware of a food allergy and keep themselves safe, safe and then they kind of rest on that and they get confident and get complacent. I hate to say that. Sure. And then all of a sudden this kid is, you know, 10, 11, 12 and he's now getting more independence and wanting to hang out with his friends without 
about mom and dad around. So maybe there's a need to revisit food allergy protocols, food allergy knowledge. Maybe um, the food allergy information that they've received is inaccurate. So they've built some, you know, notions based on inaccurate information. So it's one of the, the pieces I'm doing is assessing what they know about their food allergy and food allergy, food allergies in general. Um, I never want to go against what their allergists say, but if I'm suspecting that maybe they're not getting the best um, care or the best advice, I might suggest getting a second opinion or at least maybe checking out another allergist to see how they feel about that. Then on top of that, I'm also honestly doing some psychoeducation on anxiety and how there's a physical and emotional component to feelings. So Mm -hmm. we're talking about our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions that are all interconnected and helping them develop awareness of their own thoughts, feelings, and actions so that they can be aware and then we can do the work to intervene somewhere in that cycle. You know, um, we might be talking about coping skills. We might be talking about relaxation skills. We might be talking about, you know, what to do in different social situations. We might be role playing things. So there's a lot of things we can do, but the key is to really help them understand what they know, where the gaps are, whether it's skills or it's education, and then helping them learn that stuff and apply it. I could see how it's so important that you're constantly reviewing, you know, information. Well, number one, you're, if that's your professional space, it's like you're constantly having to expose yourself. Mm -hmm. But also, I think this probably applies to a lot of medical diagnoses where it's like, you know, you're in a room, you've been told you have this thing going on, and maybe you have 15 minutes with the provider, because how many times do they need to tell you that you have a food allergy? Like right. they tell you once and that's it. But that doesn't mean that that one time it's now sunk in all the way. You've no. accepted it. You've thought through all these situations your kid's going to go through or you're going to go through. Yeah. You know, I could see how that would be. You have to review it a lot. And I think our brains take a while to accept that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, for sure. And. You know, acceptance is one key piece of this. I find that sometimes we run before we walk when we get a diagnosis for a chronic condition, whether it's our own or or that of our children. You know, we need to initially learn the basics. What do we need to know to get us through day to day at the current stage of life we're at? Not, you know, my child's three and I'm worried about high school right now because Mm -hmm. that is going to elevate your anxiety levels. Mm -hmm. Of course it would. Anyone's would. Mm -hmm. So it's learning to walk before you run, getting the information you need. And if that means, okay, you walk away from being newly diagnosed and you have to revisit questions with your allergist because, oh my gosh, now it's sunk in and I'm going, well, I didn't ask that question. So then that's what you need to do. You know, it's, it's not just that, but it's also, there's, there's, a lot of research and data out there now about social media Mm. and online support groups and what value they bring to those managing a chronic health condition. Um, And they do bring a lot of value too, because there's a lot of peer support there and asking others, well, how did you handle this? Or, you know, what Mm -hmm. should I think of this? But I do like to, you know, remind people that, that you may not get the most accurate information there. Um, you might get a lot of anecdotes, which are helpful and have a place in the space, but you want to make sure that you're getting the bulk of your accurate information so that you can build your plan best as can be early on and throughout the, the journey from accurate resources. So where do you find to be some of the more like challenging scenarios for mm-hmm. the clients that you work with? Is it, you know, when their kid's at school? Is it thinking about, hey, if my kid goes over to a friend's house. Are there kind of commonalities or, or things that tend to be more challenging scenarios for the clients that you work with? Um, all of the above. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's really anything and everything because the human mind can go so many places. Mm-hmm. So, um, but some common ones are obviously, you know, it's different when you have a child. And again, I, I keep talking about parents, but a lot of this obviously different stages of life can apply to adults too. I I don't want to forget the adults because a lot of food allergy focus tends to be on families and parents, but adults who are newly diagnosed with an allergy are just as important and need their support as well. But for this, I'll focus a little bit more on families and kids. You know, so if you think about, and there's an evolution as a parent in general, but if you add this chronic health condition layer on top of it, no matter what it is, there's an added um, layer at all times. And so, 
you have to allow yourself to grow with the child and go from being their protector at the younger ages when they can't do for themselves to maybe being a coach or a guide. And, you know, you have to transition that. And so I think times like that are really hard. Um, You know, sometimes I'll see more parental anxiety and the kid is like, I got this. It's fine. No worries. And that might actually trigger more parental anxiety because they're like, well, then they're Mm, not really focused on their food (laughs) allergy and they're not going to bring their EpiPen. And, And then other times I'll see where it's the child who has the increased anxiety over maybe having had a reaction or a re- maybe sometimes when they get to the age where they have the realization that, you know, gosh, you could die from a food allergy because that's not something we like to talk in that kind of language when they're younger. You know, we want to stress how important it is and how crucial it is to really be on top of this, but not to that degree because that's frightening for a young child here. They might suddenly have the awareness of that and then their anxiety levels shoot up. And so parents are trying to, you know, bring them back to a space of, you know, hey, we can find this balance. It's okay. And they just, they're stuck. So at that times, we'll see more avoidant behaviors. I've seen kids who, you know, won't go out to eat anymore, even to places that they've deemed safe. Mm. They won't eat foods. So this is that excessive avoidant behavior that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, They won't eat certain foods that they know are safe and they've checked. Um, Again, and you always have to check labels every time. If your goldfish Mm -hmm. crackers were safe last week, you still have to check every week because Mm -hmm. manufacturers can change. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm. So, so I'll see those kinds of behaviors. I'll see sometimes you know, again, if the anxiety related to the food allergy becomes so big, it can spill into other areas of their lives. So now they're maybe more anxious about other things. And so their world sometimes will get smaller sure. because they're uh, they're scared. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's a whole host of things. But it's yeah. basically, you know, it stems from feeling like there's a bunch of unpredictability out there and a lack of control. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I like to do is focus on the fact that if we know our tools and we have what we need and we have our epinephrine, we know our plan, we have accurate food allergy information, we understand our our self, our thoughts, our feelings and how we're gonna react, we can prepare for things and we may not be able to control everything, but another key piece is that so many parents especially will want to avoid the thought of their child having a reaction and so all it becomes Mm -hmm. is avoidance it talks about avoidance and again we may have to avoid certain situations my goal is to help them understand and and remind themselves that if a reaction happens Mm -hmm. you can handle it Mm -hmm. if we can't we may not be able to avoid reactions Mm -hmm. yeah but if it happens you have the skills you have the tools review them let's build your confidence you guys can get through this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. You know. As we're talking about this, I, I have to be honest, I've never taken my brain to like this concept. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because as Charlie said, I've always thought of it like, oh, you have a allergy. Great. Don't eat that anymore. Mm-hmm. Move on. You know? But thinking about different things, you know, different medical things I've had come up, you know, it's like, it takes a while to work with that. Yeah. But I was just thinking, this is also really huge for adults, too. I was thinking, you know, we do a lot of business networking. Could you imagine if yeah. you're like the president of a company or even just, you know, you work somewhere and it's like one day, you know, you're fine mingling and socializing and going to these parties or, you know, get togethers or networking and just, you know, having some of the food that's there. And then the next day or, you know, the next month, it's like, OK, well, do I really want to have a reaction in front of all of my work colleagues right. or what does that look like? on me or to me you know what yeah. is pe- what do people see when that happens I yeah. could see how as an adult that could be quite crippling too yeah if you've gone your whole life eating a food and suddenly your body decides your immune system decides nope I don't like that food anymore and in fact I'm going to have a you know potentially life-threatening reaction when you put it in me um, that changes your world yeah. and some people can navigate that well and s- others can't and some of the factors that help determine that is you know what's your personality style how do you handle changes in the past that are you know unrelated changes but how do you handle transition do you have coping skills do you have a work environment or mm-hmm. supportive friends and family that are willing to help you on that journey are you getting adversity from people about that um, but again yeah it, it the question becomes you know how much risk do I do I want to even try at that business dinner or do I want to just you know and again I think too carrying your epinephrine auto injector if you're not used to carrying that and suddenly every time you leave 
or anytime you're anywhere, you need to have that. That's going to be a total adjustment to your lifestyle too. Yeah. You know, how do you, for guys, where do you fit that in? And they keep trying to make smaller and smaller ones to yeah. help with carrying it. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a lot of transition and some will navigate that fine uh, and others won't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, the, the communities, I would say overall, are definitely, I think, becoming more aware yes. in, in starting to incorporate guidelines and regulations around food allergies. I think that, you know, the, the biggest places where, where I've noticed it, one is like restaurants with maybe like, um, you know, gluten-free menus or, or, you know, marking ingredients on, you know, on menu items. Yeah. Secondly, Southwest Airlines, when they stop serving peanuts. <laughs> oh, that was Which a big... Which we were very upset <laughs> about, oh but I can understand. <laughs> Oh, and that was a big thing. I'm on I'm on a lot of social media professionally and oh my goodness, was that a big deal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um and then third is within the schools. Yeah. And and so I mean, we don't have a child in school right now, but we've yeah. heard from clients and from friends of ours who have parents who have kids in schools. Just the you know, it's not like you can bring, you know, homemade brownies or right. a- anything like that anymore. But I know that you've been very active as far as reshaping the policies in schools. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, no more bake sales from home. Ba- and that's not just food allergies. That's also, you know, kids are developing other chronic conditions like diabetes or they're overweight and things like that. So I think it's a, it's not just food allergies that are that food allergies sort of become the the a scapegoat, the scapegoat yeah. for everything. But it's really more than just food allergies that helped sort of push those changes in place. Um, myself, <clears throat> Going back to that empowerment shift for me where I had to make a change, otherwise I was going to wallow in my own victim stance, was that I decided to become involved in the PTO. So at our elementary school, I um, started on committees. I was uh, chair of the room parent committee. Room parents obviously are in charge of running the parties and all of those things. And then eventually I got, I don't know if you want to say sucked into or or brought up into (laughs) PTO presidency. (laughs) And I did that for two years. And so the principal at the time, and the district were taking a look at policies and there had been a reaction at a party in our school and they ended up district-wide again this wasn't my work but certainly having a food allergic parent on as PTO president sure. made it like helpful mm-hmm. the dist- our district ended up changing so that there are no food at, at parties at all oh wow and so it's just focused wow. on games mm-hmm. and you know what the reality is the kids are okay with that oh, I'm sure, the yeah. parents have a bigger problem with that because yeah. again there's this concept of change well that's not how it was when we were kids and right. we had home baked goods and why are we you know but the kids honestly all they want to do is not learn mm-hmm. and have fun. And whether that involves food or not is really not such a big deal to them. Well, you know, that's such a great point because I think when I first heard about, you know, not being able to bring homemade food, I mean, that's exactly where my mind went yeah. is the kind of those those feelings that you had, you yeah. know, as a little kid growing up when you would bring him like, and it's almost felt like it was robbing me of yes. that experience. It's like, it, the kids now, they don't know. They, no. It, it yeah. makes no. no difference to them. No, when you think about a Halloween party, too, I mean, like, what are they going to do right when they get home? They're going to go out and get more candy, right? right? right. Yeah. So do they really need a ton of stuff in the class? Probably not. Mm-hmm. And again, it's not just food allergies. It's just mm-hmm. in general health, yeah. you know? Yeah. Plus, we would have like, what, pizza parties, and it yeah. would be like, well, for 30 minutes, instead of learning, we're going to eat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they're it's done in five. No party. Right. And yeah. they're done in five minutes eating, and then exactly. you have kids running around the classroom. So right. those games actually are useful it's instead like of the you food. You would have done that anyways. So yeah. you're right. It's yeah. a great point. Yeah. But change is hard in general. So. For sure. No, yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. So, Tamara, if one of our listeners is hearing this conversation right now yeah. and they themselves were recently or at some point diagnosed with a food allergy or their child has been diagnosed with a food allergy and they are either experiencing anxiety or they are not wanting to experience anxiety, like everything's good right now, but they want to make sure they get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. What are some things that they can do to kind of start this process of making sure from a mental emotional standpoint that they stay in the clear as best as possible? So again, I go back to this concept that um, anxiety is not the thing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Um, Anxiety is just a basic human emotion that we all have in different situations and sometimes it's you know a useful emotion and sometimes it gets excessive and it's not so I think what they can do is to start just being aware of what situations 
bring up excessive or more anxiety if their anxiety levels peak um, or feel stressful and keep track of that. Are there certain times, certain places they go to, certain um, interactions or certain things that are going on that that peak those anxiety levels? And then from there, start investigating. I like people to be a private investigator. Why? Why are you feeling ill-equipped for that situation? Is it because you don't have enough information on how that's going to go? Is it because you don't have a plan in place? Is it because you haven't practiced your plan? Is it because maybe you haven't prepared your child enough? Is it just because you're nervous because you're out of control? So starting to identify what is it that is peaking your your worry levels, your, your stress, your fear, and be an investigator as to figuring out why. And then from there, coming up with solutions, you know, what do I need to do to adjust that? And if it's something where, you know, you're, again, people will ask, well, how do I know I need to reach out to a counselor for help, whether it's for this or something else? And truly, everybody's level of anxiety is going to be different. And somebody might have more anxiety than the next person, but for them, it's not presenting a problem. They're able to figure out ways to manage it and navigate life without excessive avoidance, whereas somebody else might not be. So what I typically tell people is if you or your children, if you're noticing that it's impacting daily life, you're not able to compartmentalize at times or put boundaries up with those thoughts or get through situations and you find yourself avoiding more things or your kids are avoiding more things or you find that new behaviors are coming up that are um, unhealthy or you find that you're unable to allow your child to develop and you know grow up and have normal life experiences again with precautions put in place of course then it might be a good idea to reach out to a, a counselor to get that help so that you can sort of adjust and get back on track awesome yeah those are wonderful tips so yeah. that is phenomenal information for our listeners to yeah. kind of help improve their own health and, and stay on top of things but you know I'm curious what do you do on a, like a daily <laughs> and weekly basis to promote your own health yeah so therapists have to be healthy too right mind yeah. and body and um, sometimes we're better about that than others um, you know we often and we'll have a therapist of our own or consultation group so we can talk with our peers about, you know, the stressors related to being a therapist because there are some. But for me personally, you know, I, I try to be diligent about exercise routines. My goal is two to four times a week. Awesome. I have a spin bike in my room. Nice. Uh, when my gym closed, I bought one of those. And, you know, sometimes I'm better at it than others. It depends on what's going on time of the year. And then, you know, I'll say, hey time to, you know, something will trigger and be like, you need to pay more attention to your, you know, your mind and body here and not so much of everybody else's. Um, I'm also, you know, aware of my stress levels Mm. and I try to take good self-care. And again, for self-care, myself or others, it's quality over quantity. Mm. So people will say, well, I don't have time to, you know, make it about myself or Mm -hmm. sit in the bathtub or read a book or watch a silly show. It doesn't matter if it's five minutes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's just some time to be about you, Mm -hmm. to find your center again. And that looks different for everybody. So for me, I watch ridiculous reality shows (laughs) and I take my therapist hat on and I yell at the TV like a normal person. I Right. Yeah. I have some me time where I'm not mom or I'm not wife, or I'm not therapist. You know, I try to practice um, breathing, you know, uh, square breathing where I'm in, hold it, breathe out, kind of relax my central nervous system if I need to. And just, you know, I try during the week time to eat eat healthy. Nice. Um, And then on the weekend, maybe not be so diligent about (laughs) it. So I try to have balance. For me, it's about balance. And when that balance is out of whack, being aware and then pulling it back. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's great stuff. So... If one of our listeners is hearing this right now, and kind of like you said earlier, they're feeling like what they're experiencing is maybe starting to get in the way of daily life, of mm-hmm. daily activity, how could somebody connect about uh, connect with you, sure. learn more about you and your practice? Sure. So um, I have a couple of presences on um, on social media. I do have a Facebook page for my, my private practice, and that's Tamara Hubbard LCPC. Again, that's also my website, www.tamarahubbardlcpc.com. So so that's more about my clinical practice here in Illinois. Um, again, I, I typically work with women, moms, uh, young adults, those going through life transitions, and of course, food allergies. And then I also sort of have a national brand called the Food Allergy Counselor. So if somebody said the Food Allergy Counselor, a lot of people 
go, oh, it's Tamara. Mm-hmm. So that's www.foodallergycounselor.com. And on that website is just a bunch of resources. I have a resource page for anything having to do with psychosocial mental health related to food allergies. There is a national directory, the Food Allergy Counselor directory I've created because I'm licensed in Illinois and not all these other states. Sure. So what I wanted to do was find other allergy informed clinicians like myself in other states so that people had an easier time accessing them. So I created that and that's there. Um, and then also there's a blog. Mm. So there's a couple of places. I'm on Instagram um, under counselor Tamara, counselor underscore Tamara. And uh, my son, my 12 year old hates that. He's like, mom, <laughs> oh my God, why, that's such an embarrassing name. I'm like, your mom's a counselor. I don't know what to tell you. Just be real, be honest. I'm sorry. I'm a counselor. That's um, embarrassing. Yeah, at 12, everything's embarrassing. That's so, so um, <laughs> And then I'm on Twitter at uh, it's t- it's at Tamara tweets. Awesome, very cool. Right. Yeah. Now, Tamara, is there anything that I that we haven't asked you that we should have asked you about your area of expertise? I think you guys did a great job. Um, cool. Like I said, I you know people think I only do food allergies. I don't. I you know I like I said I enjoy working with women and, and moms and parents and young adults. Um, but I just think I, I thank you guys for having me on here in general just to talk about this because yeah, like you said, there's a, there's more awareness of food allergies. But again. I like to understand, is that awareness accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do people really understand what goes through? And food allergy parents get this reputation that we're just a pain in the butt Mm -hmm. and we're excessive. And really, truly, honestly, all we're trying to do is keep our kids safe. And sometimes, yeah, we don't approach it well because we're exhausted having to advocate all the time and we're just tired of it. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think with people, if they have a, a better understanding, then they can understand and have compassion mm-hmm. and be part of the solution rather than the problem. No, for sure. Absolutely. So Tamara, the question that we like wrapping up with for yep. all of our guests is what is your definition of health? Uh, so I saw that and I thought, gosh, that's a tough question. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, can I have the definition not have the word health in it? And mm-hmm. I said, no, I can't. So what I came up with is my definition of health is finding a balance between physical and mental health that allows you to function at optimal levels. Mm. I, like I think it's awesome. a, it has to be yeah. a combination of both. Definitely. And I, I like the word optimal in there. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a really, really important word. Yeah. Because we can all be functioning, mm-hmm. but are we functioning at optimal levels? And if not, what yeah. can we do to adjust to make that happen? No, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tamara, thank you for the work that you do for oh, the, the advocacy that, that you put forth, the energy you put into all of that. Yeah. And, you know, I can really appreciate, you know, what you are doing and what you are striving to do with, you know, trying to look out for your kid, but you yeah. know, look out for everybody else as well. So, yeah, no, thank you for, oh. for doing that work. And thank you. I appreciate it. For sure. And thanks for coming on and, you know, sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. Uh, I know our listeners are going to love this episode. So <laughs> we really appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate it too. So thanks for having me. You bet. And for our listeners, who do you know that needs to hear this episode? Who do you know that needs to connect with Tamara and find out more about the work that she's doing? Share this episode with them so they can learn about what they need need to do if they're experiencing food allergies, if they have a loved one that's experiencing food allergies, so they can feel the freedom in their life to experience life to its fullest. And while you're online, if you wouldn't mind, head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. It helps so much when people search for podcasts on health, when people search for podcasts on exercise, when people search for podcasts on allergies, this podcast to come up higher. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Have a fantastic week. We'll talk with you all next week.